Today's guest is brought to us by Authentic Media. Authentic Media, a top choice for military aviation enthusiasts, delivers fascinating topics weekly. From the complexities of the F-22A fighters to the intricacies of test pilot school and There I Was stories, Authentic Media covers a range of unique topics. For channel subscribers that want a deeper dive into military aviation topics, Authentic Media is a perfect complement for the price of a cup of coffee every month. Get easy and flexible access to Authentic Media on major platforms, including Spotify and Apple Podcasts. You can also use their custom URL for other podcast apps. All right, joining me for this episode is a first-time guest. It's Brian, call sign Sunshine Sinclair. Brian, welcome to the channel. Hey, Mooch, thanks for having me. Tell us a little bit about your aviation background. Did S3s for a little bit. They sunned that down. I went off to Navy postgraduate school, picked up a master of science in astronautical engineering. From there, I went back to the fleet and did F-18Cs, uh, was over the skies of Iraq and Afghanistan, and then went, picked up department head, went over to F-18Es, so the Super Hornet now, or the Rhino. Uh, same kind of rinse and repeat, multiple carrier combat deployments, if you will. And then from there, after that, I actually went back to the Naval Academy and taught in the aerospace engineering department, did uh, subsonic, supersonic, so kind of compressible flow, as well as uh, basically astrodynamics, so orbital mechanics, whatnot. And then from there, went off to the Air Force Test Pilot School. So still a Navy guy. I was the Navy exchange pilot for Air Force Test Pilot School. And then from there, went to China Lake, did some weapons testing. I focused pretty much on ASUW, so anti-surface warfare weapons, so things that are coming off F-18s and schwacking ships. And then my twilight tour was back in my wife's hometown of San Diego, and I was a depot pilot, so the chief test pilot. So overall, kind of in summary, a little over 2,600 flight hours, just under 600 carrier arrested landings or traps, uh, four combat deployments with some green ink in there, if you will. Uh, flew a little over, I think it was 33, so a little over 30 different types of aircraft, both Navy and Air Force inventory, fixed wing, rotor, uh, prop. We did some uh, civilian, some extra 300 kind of rides too, if you will. So overall, it was a survey course. I didn't really deep dive in any one aspect of the Navy, but I'll tell you what, Mooch, probably like you, I just enjoyed the hell out of it. Yeah, it's a very eclectic career, Sunshine. My audience always wants to know how we got our call signs. So how did you get Sunshine? Well, uh, my first fleet tour, my first shore tour, if you or sea, uh, sea tour, excuse me, I required no coffee. So no caffeine in the morning. So I'd show up to my to the ready room or to my briefing space annoyingly happy. And the rest of the squadron pretty much relied on caffeine to get them going. So instead of the uh, morning, it was more of a shut up sunshine. And then it just kind of stuck. And I haven't been able to shake it since. There's nothing worse than an overly cheerful guy first thing in the morning. Just ask so. my wife. She still has to deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> so your background, and as you said, you've flown a lot of type model series. Uh, has sort of led you to an interest in this UFO slash UAP phenomenon. And that's why we have you on today. I've done a few episodes. This isn't a UFO channel. In fact, every time I do a UFO episode, people are like, hey, don't make this into a UFO channel. That's, that's not what's going on here. However, this phenomenon is of interest to military aviators, and it seems to have a military root note, and we'll talk about that uh, over the course of this discussion. But the original episode I did was an analysis of the Tic Tac FLIR tapes and that VFA-41 situation that happened way back in 2004. It's kind of a predicate for some of what we're talking about here because the principal in that episode is also one of the guys we're going to talk about today in terms of this most recent testimony on the Hill. So a couple of weeks ago, Sunshine, the House Committee for something, Intelligence for UAP Oversight, I'm not sure what the exact name of this committee is, had some folks come by to testify. And in some cases, these are kind of the usual suspects. So what happened on the Hill and who was there? So it was, the, uh, it was, a, it was a subcommittee of the House Committee of Oversight and Accountability. Mooch, looking at the, the report from that subcommittee hearing on the 26th of July, the glossy brochure, if you will, pretty much says the purpose of this hearing was UEP implications on national security, as you mentioned earlier, public safety and government transparency. So with that, we had the three witnesses. And if you don't mind, we'll uh, kind of just rank and file, talk through them, talk about their background, uh, their intentions, if you were, or their suspected motivation. And they actually mention what their motivation is. And then also some of the uh, some of the facts or ideas that they talk about. We'll start with Dave Fravor. 
call sign sex. So uh, toward the end of the testimony, actually, he was all three of them were asked, what's your motivation for being here? And I got the biggest chuckle out of Sex's response. He said, well, I'm here because basically a friend of mine kept bugging me to do it, saying, hey, you got one of the most credible UFO accounts in history. So be there to provide credibility for this this witness hearing, if you will. And I think it took after try number six that Sex finally said, OK, OK, I'll put on a suit and go down to the hill. So he was there to establish credibility. As we mentioned earlier, he's got the most credible UAP account in history. And when I say credible, I'm talking about the actual metrics or data capture, right? So I'm thinking about the AT FLIR video of which you spoke earlier, as well as the Nimitz, the E2 Airborne at the time, and the Princeton all had, let's say, weapon quality track or at least surveillance quality track radar uh, hits, if you will, on these items. So it was uh, obviously very, very well documented. One thing he did mention in the hearings is that he wished that he would have turned on his Jehemix or his joint helmet mounted queuing system, his helmet mounted camera. But a lot of the guys, including myself, we did not because it's not stabilized the video and it's real squirrely. And there's usually there's better things to tape, if you will, in the plane, the displays than the helmet mounted queuing system. So totally makes sense why he didn't do it. And then being, you know, an armchair quarterback, you could see how that might have helped further document this encounter. So this guy has been flying for 18 years. He's the skipper. He's out there with a section, so he's got a backseater. He's in, a, in an F model, as well as his wingman is an F model. So you have four brains or eight eyes, however you want to look at it, in pretty much CAVU, right, or very extremely VFR, very clear weather with not a lot of sea state, not a lot of wave tops, right? So it makes for really ideal viewing conditions for anything, even if you're up in the high teens to low 20s. He's got some good visual acquisitions of uh, things because of the environmentals. And the thing that really stuck out in my mind, Mooch, was the, the, the manner in which this thing moved. So it did not seem to abide by what I would call Newtonian physics. So thinking of Newton, thinking of his three laws, right? The first law is going to be defining inertia. Things that are at rest tend to stay at rest. Things that are in motion tend to stay in motion, right? So that's inertia defined. As well as the second one is you got to apply a force to a mass to have acceleration. And then finally, you're looking at the equal and opposite rules. So all three of those really play into our everyday lives, right? Whether we're turning and burning in a jet or we're taking a left-hand turn in a car, right? We got we to gotta abide basically by those rules. And he's saying this Tic Tac pretty much has no inertia to it. It makes sharp right-hand and left-hand or 90-degree turns. It accelerates uh, ridiculously quickly, right? And um, so it's just amazing that this thing doesn't seem to have any kind of mass to it, or at least doesn't obey the Newtonian physics laws. What I also found interesting is someone asked him, hey, so how did these tapes become declassified? And he said, well, honestly, it wasn't that big of a deal. He finished his flight. He went down to Civic, right, the Carrier uh, Intelligence Center, and he gave his debrief. And the tape sat there for a while. And then his skipper, he finally asked for him back, put him in the, the ready room vault because it is classified property of the squadron they have to keep track of. And then it sounds like they pretty much just forgot about him. You know, so it's not like it went off to some men in black and got analyzed in some underground fortress in D.C. or anything. Right. So he also mentioned and this was the breaking news part of his testimony uh, was that they had been jammed by the, the, the Tic Tac. Uh, and that's the first time that he'd ever said that publicly, that not only had they captured the data, but that item had jammed them. The other thing, Moots, that he pointed out that was interesting is when the thing accelerated away from him, when he was going two circle with it, right, in the descending two circle fight, is that the thing kind of disappeared and it showed up at their cap. And so not only is this thing moving intelligently, tactically, but also on an operational level. So what I mean by that is, Somehow, whoever's controlling this thing knew the traffic pattern of the carrier air wing. So there's some kind of intelligent source connected to the Tic Tac that's observing over days, over months, or or is there a chance that it's actually a U.S. entity and they knew the whole COM2X flight plan? Sunshine, you bring up a great point with respect to the fact that it has some intelligence. It is defying Newtonian physics, as you say but not without some structure. It's not just pinging off all quadrants. It's going places and doing things that seem to have some bearing on particularly what those Black Ace jets were doing that day. The other thing, as we review the three witnesses, because I concur with you, Skipper Fravor is the most credible because he's our pedigree, right? This guy has no reason to be a conspiracy theorist or whoever's drawn to 
the UFO ecosystem. When he talks, I, it, it makes me do more than just dismiss it out of hand because it doesn't follow the Newtonian laws of physics. So who, who was the second uh, witness? It was another air crew, F-18F pilot. He was with the VFA-11 Red Rippers. And that's Ryan Graves, call sign FOBS. Uh, and I'm going to speculate here, but as best I can tell, FOBS is full of bull stuff. <laughs> so uh, the Rippers are an East Coast squadron. They operate out of NAS Oceana, Virginia Beach, Virginia. Right. And as you know, well, as a, as a Tomcat guy. Right. So they got Whiskey 72 out there. That's the warning area where they go for training. Right. And as you can imagine, uh, good order and discipline here when you got a bunch of very expensive jets moving quickly. So you have to have entry and exit points. And uh, digging back into the Wayback Machine, I think it was Knotts and Biggie with the name of the entry points. So basically, there's an entry point, meaning a lat long, so a longitude, latitude, as well as an altitude for entering and exiting said whiskey area, Whiskey 72 in this case, right? So you would fly in through there. So there's a very standard departure, trying to keep everything very scripted, very standard to minimize variables when you're going quickly, obviously. So they would blast off, head out to Whiskey 72, and they were getting a lot of sights right around the vicinity of the entry point at, at Whiskey 72 there, probably at Knotts or Biggie. And so these things, and this is what really caught me. There's a bunch of, and this guy's great, right? And I love his testimony. He talks about either he saw or he heard accounts of, so secondhand info of, um, there's actually, take that back, secondhand info of a section. So two F-18 Super Hornets flying out to the whiskey area. Uh, they're flying in formation within relative close proximity. And one of these orbs, one of these UAPs actually splits the section, right? So it goes in between them. Now, I don't know if the, and he didn't quite mention if the UAP then kept up with their speed or was very stationary and they blew by it. Because if they blew by it, I'm thinking they're going a typical max range profile, like, you know, 300 knots or something. So to have something in close proximity zip by you when you're going 300 knots, I don't know how much uh, resolution or clarity one would have with his eyes. But apparently over time, guys seeing them at a certain distance so that, you know, further away, track crossing rate is less. You can more focus on something. They were describing these shapes as dark colored cubes encased in a sphere. So it's not, that's not a Tic Tac, right? This is a different shape. Correct. A different shape. So what year is this? Because the first occurrence, 2004. So what's FOB's time frame here, roughly? 2011 to 2012, 2013, somewhere in there. Because a lot of folks want to just say, hey, nothing's happened since 2004. And they forget about FOBS's circumstance, right? Because they also have data. They have FLIR footage as well. There's a whole fleet of them. Look on the ASA. My gosh. They're all going against the wind. The wind's 120 knots to the west. Look at that thing, dude. That's not an LNS though, is it? It's not that is an LNS, dude. Well, if there's a like other thing, it's rotating. People, I think, want to conflate that FLIR B-roll into sure. a single event and, and yeah. ascribe that to the 2004 occurrence. So this is much later. Yes. Right? So we got to make that clear. Yeah, great point, Mooch. And also, this isn't a singular instance or occurrence, right? So he talked about up and down the eastern seaboard there. So we got guys doing, you remember back when Cecil was a thing, right, with legacy uh, hornets, if you will. So you got guys blasting off out of Florida and heading east, probably over the Atlantic to do exercises. They're running into them there. So, and then we also have Key West, which is a great place for BFM, as you probably remember. Yes, I've done many sorties out of Boca Chica as a RAG instructor. That whole eastern seaboard, there's been a lot of instances of this. So Ryan kind of stepped back and got a bigger picture of, whoa, this, this thing is happening a lot. 
And it was to the point that they actually started putting uh, this information in notums, right? Those notice to airmen, things that we look at every day before we go flying. We look at weather and notums, right? So uh, it was enough of an instance that they, excuse me, there was a big enough sample size, right? Enough instances of this happening or occurrences that they decided to plunk it into a database, if you will, that was easily retrievable, meaning guys would just go, you can Google weather and notums and boom, it pops up. So it became kind of a standard brief. And then further, besides what briefing weather and notums, when they got to that point in the notums, what I had heard, not from the testimony, but from some other air crew, is that sometimes they'd actually anchor on the notum that talked about the UAP and said, dude, yesterday I was at this altitude and airspeed, you know, and the thing did this kind of, and you talk through the uh, kinematics or basically how it moved around. And so it was finding its way into what I would call their brief alpha, you know? So it, it's kind of, it's it was really becoming commonplace. And that was evidenced by its integration into not only the notums, but also the standard quack or the standard brief that they would give before they go flying. So, so this is at the organizational level, right? I yes, mean, yes. Uh, and and so it's it's accepted as a thing at the squadron level, but what, what, and this is getting beyond the testimony maybe, but, um, but what else was happening? Cause you have a squadron Intel officer. I so you brief that guy. He maybe talks to the CAG Intel officer um, and says, Hey, my aviators are seeing these things. And this is the altitude, the heading, the time, the DME, the everything else. And so it's trend analysis. How is this not becoming a, major big thing at the agency level in a hurry. The data capture sheets didn't always have enough information. So it would be like, like you said, time of day, maybe position, so posit and then altitude, but it didn't talk much more about it. So to me, it sounds like it kind of got filed away. Like, okay, that's great. There's another one. But so the, the way the fleet would compensate because they didn't have this uh, operational level database from which to retrieve that is they would just anecdotally just talk about it, right? So just be uh, tribal knowledge of, hey, guys, when you go into Whiskey 72, here's this thing. But now shifting back to what Fob said, he does make a note that there's a definite lack of data retrievability and metrics capture. So meaning by that, just all those kinematics we talked about earlier. And then how do you access them? It's one thing to submit a report, right? Just like you mentioned, going through maybe the Squadron AI to the CAG AI, but it's got to go to some central repository that then is easily accessible so that guys can have lessons learned, right? And it sounds like from what his testimony said is that that didn't exist, that vehicle wasn't at least that architecture or uh, infrastructure maybe was not very robust. So then after he leaves the Navy, and I think it was around 2019, he was the founder of Americans for Safe Aerospace. And with Americans for Safe Aerospace, now he's pushing for both civilian and military pilots to have easy ways to uh, basically report things as well as be able to retrieve data. And he also in that audience, the intended audience for that database is not only pilots, right? Military, civilian, but also just people on the ground so they can submit reports, just trying to build the uh, sample size, if you will, of the database. He didn't say that a system doesn't exist, but he said the system was, I believe he used the word inadequate. And so, so currently I did a little kind of deep dive on my own and they're there's a vehicle for commercial air as well as military, but pr predominantly it's going to be commercial air pilots and it's uh, to report incidences, right? It's called the uh, U.S. Domestic Events Network or DEN. And this it's a hotline, if you will. So you can type something up or you can just call and make a, a report. And it's going to be about balloons, any kind of UAPs, laser activity on the ground, something that's non-standard and either questionable or um, can be... A, a hazard, if you will, right? So, and and the the volume of the database, from what I saw, just a snapshot of a couple of years ago, from one month, it was something like eleven thousand reports. So here's another aspect of data retrieval: is if you have this data, you have this data. Let's say eleven thousand different reports. How do you parse it? How do you index it? You know, do you have someone in charge of that? It's not only just having a database, but having the architecture to be able to, or infrastructure, I guess, to be able to pull something out of it efficiently. And I could see somebody, let's say I'm a Comair pilot, I report an incident. I'm probably not going to loop into my scan, if you will, prior to walking of calling or going on the database and looking, especially if it's clunky, right? If you can't find stuff. And then back to the Navy part of it, because that resonates with me, right? Because we're a very stovepiped 
by design because we, you know, we're on aircraft carriers that are autonomous. We go over the horizon. Um, obviously, we plug into different JFACs and fleet staffs along the way, but it's supposed to be sort of, you know, self-sufficient. And so this distills down to the unit level. And so, again, I see something that I can explain or I can identify it. Like we're saying, it's either a a tic-tac shaped thing or an orb within a cube. And I can define, okay, I was just getting into Whiskey 72 at the entry point. It went beak to beak with me. I was going through the knots. It went the other way, probably as fast. I went one circle with it. it. It hung with us and so forth and so on. But I couldn't identify what it was. So I, we get to the debrief and everybody else is like, yeah, I saw it too. Or we even have FLIR footage of this. Okay. And so our Intel guy is, oh, because they're usually like Lieutenant JGs, right? They're brand new dude. He's like, okay. And, and so, in, you know, he's got that earnest sincerity and he goes to the CAG AI, who's an 0405 kind of guy. And then to your point, then what? It's like, I'll, I'll send it up the chain, but it's like firing it in a shotgun fashion with no feedback to where it went. And then you get the stigma part where generally the 06s who are concerned about their careers are like, I'm not going to be UFO guy. I'm not going to be, you know, the boy who cried aliens. So I got it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Lieutenant commander so-and-so at the CAG level. Um, and, uh, we got it. And then it just goes away. Right. And so day after day, because the, the squadron bubbers are like, we're seeing these all the time. And like you say, this becomes part of the brief, just like briefing no temps or the weather. I'm afraid we're going to have a midair with these things. So we're going to kind of have to keep briefing this stuff. And then we go to the AI and you're like, so what's going on? You're like, well, I briefed the CAG guy and he took it up to second fleet staff. And they said this, and they're over at the sink land fleet doing this. And we don't ever have any satisfaction. Like, In fact, it was this. It's not getting to NORAD or somewhere where we're like, oh my God, this is now a serious problem. Because otherwise there's no explanation. And it's like, well, why did Fobbs have to get out of the Navy and start his own not-for-profit that does what the Navy should have been doing? It doesn't make any sense, except that this is the nature of bureaucracies. And I think we have to accept that that is is a a factor here, right? Because otherwise it's just your head will explode listening to these guys testify because at some point you're like, okay, again, Skipper Fravor. This is a serious human being. He's the skipper of the squadron for crying out loud. And fiercely competent, yes. Yes, yes. And his pedigree is like front runner. He's been a a, a Marine enlisted guy. He went to NAPS. Mm -hmm. He's, you know, he's got a wild pedigree. He's not a sycophant. He's not a careerist. He's just salt of the earth. Good dude to work for by all accounts. The kind of guy you want to be in the ready room with. So why is he just going to chuck it all? Because now he wakes up one day and he goes, today's the day I'm going to like trash my career, set myself on fire because (laughs) of this UAP thing. Right. Right. It doesn't make any sense. So you're like, okay, the skipper debrief, the guys in civic. And then the tape sat there. And there was no closure. So I think he and Alex and everybody else was sort of like, I guess they're doing their thing, right? I mean, I I gave them the debrief, you know, and then literally 20 years goes by. Now 60 Minutes wants to sit down and talk to him. And then all of a sudden Congress cares. Let's roll to the third, the Intel guy. So now we're moving on to David Grush. His background is that he spent 14 years in the Air Force finished up as a major, and then moved over to the government side and was a GS-15. Right there, I'm wondering what happened. You know, traditionally folks that make it to 14 years will probably push out to 20 because of the retirement system. So, and nothing against him, I'm not saying that, but it just kind of makes me wonder, huh? So, you know, there's been some kind of a non-traditional career path here. So he's going to talk about, he works for the uh, National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, right? As well as the National Reconnaissance Office as a GS-15. And he is the the lead or one of the leads for the UAP task force at the NRO, the National Reconnaissance Office. And he also leads up a bunch of NGA UAP analysis. So basically his pedigree is going to be that he has access to a lot of information. 
as I mentioned earlier, there's at one point toward the end, really, of the, the hearing when they ask all three, so why are you here? What's your motivation? Fob says, hey, it's public safety trying to gain access to a database that's retrievable so people can use it to their advantage. Sex talked about, well, this guy bugged me enough times I finally came over. And then in contrast, uh, Mr. Grush is here saying, hey, I've just had this overwhelming sense of duty since I raised my hand. I was sworn into the U.S. Air Force. So here's a guy that's trying to do the right thing. And unfortunately, I think some of the casualties were probably his career. Now, as he continues on with his testimony, he's going to talk about, quote, brutal and unfortunate professional and personal retribution. And he's going to talk about actively planned reprisals by his leadership toward him. And he uses a term I had not heard before, Mooch, administrative terrorism. Have you heard of that? No, I, I, that's a new one. Yeah, yeah that's a new one for me, too. Yeah. So basically, I like it. I think I'm going to yeah. use it in the there future. There you go. You still <laughs> yeah. feel free to steal it. Basically, the guys above him are going to hold his career in the balance. And not only his career, but also his colleagues' career. So he mentions kind of in a, in a roundabout way because of the public venue that he has some colleagues that have been subject or victims of this administrative terrorism if they were to or when, I guess, they divulged information. So he goes through this, um, paints this kind of very dramatic picture of leadership. And it's not necessarily Air Force. It's not necessarily NRO, NGA. We, right? we really don't know the source of it based on his varied background, but he does talk about that. And what also caught me off guard was he said that he personally fears for his life. So, I mean, it's one thing to have your professional career in jeopardy, but it's another thing here in the United States to have to worry about, you know, reprisal, physical reprisal, right? For, for either him, his kids, his wife, all that stuff. So he's just painting this very kind of sad picture of uh, what's happened to him and just things that I, I wouldn't have expected or guessed. And then as he steps on through his testimony, unfortunately, there are a lot of times when he says he can't discuss further in an open forum, whether it be about physical coercion, murder, you know, biologics, so non-human, I guess he calls it, biologics, any kind of UAP reverse engineering programs, people who have been hurt on these reverse engineering programs. So hopefully that's a forcing function for that subcommittee of oversight and accountability to, hey, let's go take this into a closed door session, you know, and it doesn't have to be a skiff. And uh, so this is not on Mr. Grush's side. I think he very well understands the different levels of security, but on the other side, so the, the subcommittee side, they say things like, well, we went to Eglin Air Force Base and they wouldn't let us into the room and they wouldn't brief us on this and blah, blah, blah. And I think you and I both know very well, especially at the TSSCI level, right? with a SAP program, special access, or sensitive compartmentalized information, you have to have a need to know. And you can't just show up at someone's doorstep and expect to, to get in something just because you're, a, a, I hate to say, but a politician, right? Yeah, exactly. So I think, the as you've outlined from the outset, the, the two aviators come off as uh, reasonable guys who had these, uh, who were unwittingly drawn into this world. Um, and maybe that's just us uh, with, with, our pedigree uh, projecting. And then David Grush has this intensity. And, you, you know, we know the type. Uh, they seem to be associated with support ratings uh, like Intel or PAO or JAG or whatever. Um, sometimes they're a little eccentric. But this intensity, you can see at the unit level how this would be irritating. Again, I, like you, am not judging his sincerity to forward these concerns. I, I, I'm not saying he's lying. I'm not saying that he's got any agenda. I'm just saying that the manner with which uh, he forwards what he believes to be true against the backdrop of a military bureaucracy, you can see, which is a reality, you can see how that wouldn't play. And so when you ask, how does a 04 get you know, sidetracked at year 13, 14. Well, we know the answer to that. When really you're on glide path, all you got to do is just do what your detailer says for two or three more tours and then retire and move on and become a defense contractor or whatever. Right. So it's <laughs> almost like you've got to try yeah. to do other than that. Yeah. And so in this case, again, I'm just, I was watching the hearing. I'm like, this guy has this sort of slow burn intensity. You can imagine in a fighter squadron, 
this guy would be getting pummeled on a daily basis. And this isn't because we don't like people that don't conform. You know, you have all types in a ready room, you know, as I've documented yeah. in the punks trilogy or wherever. And as we've lived, <laughs> that's why we love it. Right. We want yeah. different dudes to come together. Right. Um, but there's a limit to it. And I think the problem with with Dave Grush is when his CEO said, I got it, Dave, we'll we'll address it. He didn't stop to the point it became prohibitive to mission readiness or whatever they were doing at the time. You know, he, he kept dragging them onto his agenda and not what the CEO said was the priorities on any given day. And so I think that's where it's like, okay, now it's not helpful, you know? And, and so you could just see this with his testimony and it starts to feel kind of more so than the other two guys, the two naval aviators, uh, it seems to feel a little bit like this guy is inclined to go the conspiracy theory route. I'm not judging his sincerity. I'm not saying he's right. lying because he, no, he wants to all. be a, a keynote at mm -hmm. some UAP conference or whatever. He's, you know, one of, a, a star on a discord server somewhere. I, I, I'm not saying I'm not ascribing any malice to him. I'm just saying that as we're trying to judge our reaction to this hearing, he was, I'll just say, the least credible to me because my spidey sense kept going off the same way it went off when a new guy would walk in the ready room and start saying kind of strange stuff. And this is all about trust and credibility and so forth and so on. You're right to flag that his profile was the outlier of the three. Let's segue to the lawmakers, because I think you had basically two kinds of folks in the room. The first were the in it to win it stalwarts who really do care about finding out the answer here. Um, and that was committee chair and some others. And the other were the performance artists who walk in, pound the table for the media hit they hope to have later that night. And it was the government is lying to us posture. I think that narrative drags us off what ground truth might be here. But there are a few guys, and I'll leave their names out. Um, they're, they're guys who generally do this sort of thing, representing the panhandle of Florida um, and, and where we went to flight <laughs> school, right? And so, um, yeah. but I'm not going to say who it is. But of course um, not. That was kind of a, okay, this isn't a serious gathering. But then you'd hear others that were like, they'd read the initial report, they'd followed this, they knew the pedigree of all three of the witnesses, they, they were very respectful. They listened to them because their follow-up questions, you know, revealed that they had in fact listened. Some of them actually, when they got to them, it's like they started from scratch. I'm like, you, have you been listening here? It's like in Zoolander. You serious? I just, I just told you that a moment ago. Right. Me going into this, I, I was hoping that everyone in the room who was about to speak would be cool, calm, and collected. So once again, reverting back to that kind of logical, analytical, leave the emotion out of it. And when they, uh, on the government side, on the, the political side, if you will, when they had their opening statements, there was one female who just, it was just injected with so much emotion that I immediately kind of wrote her off, unfortunately. You know, talking about, well, the government is doing a poor job of this and and using these emotional uh superlatives like the worst of this and like you know terrible and blah 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 and i was and I'm like all right well she's just gonna do exactly what you said looking for a media hit and then you'll move on to the next person who hopefully is less impassioned well but the thing about that and, and you are like me a hybrid you're even more of a renaissance man than i am with respect to that that gives the government too much credit the government doesn't have the ability to do these kind of machiavellian things because that that would require organization and priorities and different things that I've never worked in an organization that was capable of this kind of mendacity. Now, black programs are a different thing. And I have documented on the channel the F-117 program and what Area 51 actually was. And those are explanations for what people thought were UFOs in the mid-50s, right? This is airline pilots that are like, Hey, center, I see something up at 70,000 feet. You know, nothing flies at 70,000 feet except a U-2 and an A-12 or 
center, I just saw this thing fly. It's a black like triangle and I'm not familiar with any black triangles. And oh, by the way, then Desert Storm happens like, oh, I saw an F-117, right? But it's years after the sighting. You know, I think in some cases, I'm not going to paint with too broad a brush because the comments will light up about, you know, hey, Mooch, there could be aliens. What do you know? Right. OK. Um, but I'm what I have seen through my research for these episodes is there is a logical explanation. My two cents, because the other thing I point out in that initial episode is coincidentally, as you've flagged, you know, if it's West Coast, it's in the pop areas. If it's East Coast, it's in Whiskey 72, the tax range or whatever we call that warning area off of Cecil. It's not like Airways Nav when we're flying between Pensacola and Oceana uh, or on our way to Fallon, right? So what that makes me believe, having done some developmental test work with V-22 and watched those guys do their thing, is this is a, I don't even know how you classify it, right? Because we're talking about top secret, secret, confidential, there's SCI, there's black programs, right? So I don't know what this would be classified as, but I think, again, allowing that people like FOB and SEX are reasonable, great Americans, have, there, have no reason to conjure up a conspiracy, again, to set them their personal lives on fire. You know, so they saw what they saw. In some cases, we have actual FLIR footage. All these things I, I accept as fact. Now I got to go, okay, so what is it? Three options, foreign technology, domestic technology, or aliens. I don't think it's foreign technology because if it was foreign technology, we would already know about it and we would have either flagged it as a threat because this is what powers the defense budget. It's a valid threat. It's like Sputnik flew over. We're behind in the space race. You know, NASA was flush with cash for 20 years after that. If this was Chinese technology, let's say, we knew that, nobody's going to keep that secret. DOD and all the other three and four letter agencies are going to sing out because they want the defense dollars. They want America paranoid and telling their lawmakers, you've got to fund these things because they have that tick tack. We want to have our own tic tac. Mr. President, we must not allow a mine shaft death. I'm going to say that's not what it is. Then the other one is aliens. I don't have any data to support the existence of aliens. That doesn't mean there aren't aliens or there aren't life forms. You know, I mean, we have rovers on Mars and a helicopter on Mars. We haven't seen anything on Mars. And when I said that before, everybody's like, okay, that's one place. Mooch. That doesn't mean there aren't aliens. Fair enough. But I've never seen any information. And again, every time we thought there were aliens, whether it's Bob Lazar or Area 51, there's a perfectly good explanation. It's actually better than the alien story for why Area 51 existed. People who saw aliens, UFOs during those years actually were witness to test points of the development of the U-2 and the A-12. That brings us to option three, which is this is a ultra black American developmental test program that maybe even defies the laws of Newtonian physics. Let's anchor on your point three. So to your point about SAP programs, black programs, well, they could even be corporate IRAD right? So uh, internal research and development. So company A, doesn't matter who they are, they, they make a widget for the government, they take the profit from the widget, right? And they do some in-house research and development. There is no, to my knowledge, there is no reporting structure or requirement for them to uh, talk to the government about it because it's internal funds. It's not government funding, right? It's internal. So to my knowledge, they don't have to tell anybody. And Mr. Grush does talk about that a little bit with uh, a little more of a dramatic flair, but misappropriated funds. And then his real quick logic trail, if you will, is overpriced contracts. And the the profit is then directed toward IRAD and IRAD is not by law required for any kind of, there's no government oversight required. So these guys run off, off the range, we'll call it, and do things on their own. I can totally see that happening. So let's talk about the physics. 
And there's a lot of stuff that is completely in the theoretical realm. We don't have objective evidence to support anything to become a law, if you will, right? I'm talking about law of physics. So let's talk about, I don't know, they used to call it electrogravitics, which is kind of a misnomer from the 1920s or so. And it's more appropriately, as the way I understand it, it's better called an ionic wind. Do you remember earlier we talked, uh, let's see, uh, Fobbs, right? He talked about the, the gray cube encased in the clear sphere. Well, imagine that each of those edges of the cube has a high voltage to it, a high voltage differential. So maybe one is plus 20,000 and another edge on the other side, complete other side is minus 20,000 volts. What will happen is you have something kind of uh, called coronal discharge, but basically you start to ionize some of the molecules in the air around those uh, high voltages. In 2018, MIT came up with this ionic wind propulsion. So it's basically solid state propulsion and they proved it on a very miniature scale. They had basically a, a giant glider, as in a, a, a glider about two feet long. And they basically energized and ionized the air around the wings. And basically they took uh, nitrogen and they ionized it. And then it reacts to the electric field, the difference between those, those voltages. And as the nitrogen atoms that are ionized are moving, they grab the surrounding air and consequently there's airflow. Well, imagine that cube, those edges could have voltages assigned to them and they create the same effect. And now instead of having the airflow across a, across a wing, maybe the airflow is directly down and that counteracts gravity. And then they change the voltages across the sides, kind of the equatorial, we'll call it edges. And now maybe it produces a flow that moves the object in the opposite direction. And so that sphere is actually moving ionic air, if you will. And so it's not solid, it's just causing diffusion, almost like a hot highway, right? You know how the, the air kind of ripples the light waves and they bend. What Grush actually talks about also, which was really abstract and really hard for me to digest, was the holographic principle. We live in a 3D world, no kidding. But there's some theorists saying that there's actually a higher authority that exists in a two-dimensional world. And what we are is a projection of the 3D world. So like a hologram. So it leads to a whole bunch of very interesting quantum mechanics and the associated math. And it helps to explain black holes better, but it's a whole nother thing. So finally, interdimensional travel. So we have our three dimensions and the fourth dimension is time. So what they do is they actually capitalize on an additional dimension, you know, length, width, height, or X, Y, Z, whatever you want to call it in time. Well, then there's a fifth dimension and you move through that fifth dimension to get easily from one from point A to point B in we'll call it a, a 4D space. Here, just a real quick visual is we have a piece of paper, right? And you can see points, sorry, working with the camera here, points A and B. And let's say that's a, a long drive for somebody, right? And that's on a two dimensional flat piece of paper plane, right? So what if we manipulated this two dimensional surface in the third dimension to make the travel much more easy? So maybe that uh, let's say the Tic Tac that disappeared and showed up at the cap point without any kind of visual, you know, uh, reference as it accelerates. Maybe it exploited a fifth dimension and got there. I, who knows? These things are all possible, right? Our yeah. conception of time, space, the continuum, Newtonian physics may be flawed. But in any case, we will keep our eyes open as follow on hearings happen or other things emerge in this UAP UFO space to uh, enlighten us further. So Sunshine, thanks to Authentic Media for allowing you to join us today. Thanks for bringing Absolutely. your expertise to bear. We look to have you on again very soon to talk about Deep Intel on the Super Hornet. So we'll have you on for that soon. And uh, thanks again for being with us. Mooch, thank you very much for having me on your show. It was, uh, it was my pleasure. All right, that'll do it for this episode. If you're not already a subscriber, become one so you don't miss anything going forward. If you'd like to help support the channel, please consider using the super thanks, the heart icon below, or become a patron at patreon.com slash Ward In the meantime, I look forward to talking to you again very soon.